just how precisely timely it would be because actually just landing in my inbox this afternoon was an email from the Soil Association uh, asking everyone uh, to lobby their MPs because uh, on the 4th of November, uh, the Agriculture Bill is going to be back in the House of Commons. Uh, now, this is something that's consumed a great deal of, of many, many weeks of uh, Jenny Jones, my fellow Green Peer, and my time. And you, as was being referred to, this is very much a passion area. I can get very, very geeky about soil science. Uh, but, you know, I'll be kind to you this evening and I won't get too geeky about soil science. Although if you really want me to, you can always put some questions in. Um, and I am proud of the fact that in my maiden speech uh, about a year ago now in the Lords, uh, I got uh, the word tardigrades into Hansard for the first time ever. Uh, which it kind of tells you something that it hadn't previously been in Hansard. And actually, uh, Jenny and I have been having a lot of fun in the last day or two. Um, Jenny this week got the second mention of hypercapitalism in, and I got it in several times more today. So, you know, Greens, we bring lots of new, new ideas and new thoughts and new subjects to the table. Uh, but food and farming is, of course, very, very close to our hearts. Um, when you think about the climate emergency, the nature crisis, and indeed the crisis of public health in our society with the levels of obesity, of poor diets, of diabetes, all of things, of um, aspects which the COVID-19 uh, crisis has very much preyed upon. And of course, the nature crisis and the destruction of the natural world has something to do with the emergence of, of COVID-19 itself. All of these things are interrelated. And it's also, I think, politically, has huge potential as a subject area. Um, the whole nature, broken nature of our food system is something that's getting increasing tension. Henry Dimbleby, who the government probably now regrets commissioning to do a new food strategy for um, England, um, is being really quite uh, scathingly critical of the government and the current system, uh, not just about free school meals. Uh, and so you know, this is politically crucial. And the fact is, of course, that everybody eats so pretty well everyone has an opinion on food and it's something where we as Greens have a lot to say, a lot that's different to what other people say and it's really crucial. But perhaps I'll kind of start with the, um, the, the politics of it and where we are. So as I said, you, know, you might have got a lobbying email from the Soil Association, 4th of November, Agriculture Bill back in the Commons. And this is going to be one of the crunch points of the collision between the House of Lords and the Commons, because it's in the Commons because the House of Lords um, insisted uh, on amendments that for shorthand uh, try to ensure we don't have chlorinated chicken and hormone laced beef um, coming from America. Uh, and just because I suspect there's probably a few vegetarians and vegans on the call, everyone talks about those particular foodstuffs, but America also uses scores of pesticides on fruit and vegetables um, that are banned in the EU and have been banned in the UK. Um, and so, you know, you can't say, as people sometimes say to me on Twitter, well, it won't affect me because I'm a vegetarian or a vegan. Oh, yes, it will, I'm afraid. And one of the other things to say about this is the Americans are very resistant to food labelling that shows the origins of food and any free trade deal, they're going to want to try and insist on not having that labelling. But also, at least pre-COVID, um, about a third of calories consumed in Britain were consumed outside the home. And of course, when you eat in the school canteen or when you eat in the, um, in the office um, a cafe or when you, you know, dip into a takeaway on the way home, very often you'll have no idea where that's come from and it will often be from the cheapest kind of sources, which means those kind of sources. So that is, those two amendments are kind of the surviving amendments. Um, the House of Lords did originally send six amendments to the bill and that's a pretty amazing sign of the way in which the House of Lords is now the centre of political resistance in Westminster. Uh, I did actually say to them, um, a few months ago now when it was it felt less true than it does feel true now actually that you know, i was talking about the climate strikers and said you know you house of lords average age 70 you have to be the champions of the climate strikers here in westminster because the undemocratic house of commons where boris johnson has 100 percent of the power having one backing of 44 percent of people who voted uh won't stand up for them so you house of lords have to um, and actually what we're seeing is that's happening more and more the government is being defeated roundly almost on a daily basis. And we're going to see some very interesting things coming up with the internal market bill where the leader of the crossbenchers, the, um, 
the non-party peers who are normally very small C conservative or we're not elected so we can't do too much to upset the government or go against the government. Uh, the leader of the crossbenchers is planning to basically try and throw out the whole uh, section of the internal market bill that breaks, uh, breaks international law uh, in probably Monday week. Um, and that's in committee stage where normally we don't even have votes. So you know, the House of Lords is resistance. Uh, we're going to have to see what happens in the Commons on the 4th of November. Um, hopefully what we'll see is a few more Tory peers. And if we think about there's probably some of them not in Cambridge, but around in, uh, in around you, uh, Tory peers who are under a lot of pressure from the NFU, from farming constituents saying, you know, you have to defend us against these um, American imports. Uh, and if we can hopefully see a few more Tories rebelling, uh, then that's going to encourage the, the Lords to actually stand firm and try and insist on keeping in the bill, which is where we get to the wonderful thing called ping pong, um, which is literally, um, we've sent it back to the Commons. If they chuck our amendments out and send it back to us, we could end up where it goes back and forth between the houses with a matter of a couple of hours between them. Um, and that's what ping pong is. And, you know, I don't know how tough the Lords are going to be in standing up to the Commons. It will depend a lot on how much the um, how, how much the Commons is starting to sway. And, you know, we have a very unstable government at the moment, but we'll see. So that's a bit about the politics. Um, I also want to talk because I think it's we really need to think about. And I was asked to sort of put forward a question for people to ponder in the discussion phase of this. So I'll put this question out there and sort of try and answer it myself, give you my answer. And then you can see what you think about that. Which, so my question is, what should uh, be growing in the countryside around Cambridge? Is the question. Um, uh, and sort of more broadly, what should it look like? And if we look at some of the debates behind the Agriculture Bill and some of the, the sort of big philosophical issues behind a lot of those debates, it comes down to what's known as sparing versus sharing. Um, now, the government came into this bill with the idea of public money for public good. You may well have heard that phrase. And the idea of that was that we pay farmers to keep some bits of the countryside really, really pristine, you know, really nice, as close to natural as possible, somewhere for the, for the skylarks to, to swoop around, uh, for, the, for the field mice to, to nest in the hedges. So we'll pay farmers to leave some of the land like that. That's sparing some of it. And the idea was we'll basically keep bashing the rest of it as hard as we possibly can, um, keep up industrial farming, keep up those kind of practices. Um, and uh, but, you know, we're trading it off because we're, we're leaving some of it to to be the bits for nature. Uh, whereas alternatively, the side that we as Greens are on, that lots of people like the Soil Association are on, is what's known as sharing. And the foundation of that is the idea that every bit of land should be treated as well as it possibly can be. That, you know, lots of it, most of it should be growing food, but it should be growing food in a way that's good for nature and that's also producing healthy diets for people. And if we think about the picture of what that potentially looks like, um, you know, I, what I know about the, the land around Cambridge is you'll have huge amounts of industrial monoculture very large fields with very large tractors running over them, um, you know, utterly flattened out, uh, no ponds, no mires, no hedges, um, everything turned into something that is much like a billiard table as can be managed um, with huge expanses of identical crops. And those crops will be treated with large quantities of herbicides and pesticides. Because of course what you do when you put out this huge field of wheat or barley or rapeseed is you're saying to every pest and disease anywhere within the vicinity, hey, there's an enormous feast here. Come and have an enormous feast and breed up your numbers enormously and go wild. And what you're going to do to manage that is spray large amounts of pesticide, herbicide, fungicide all over that crop to, to, to keep it going. Um, what the sharing people are saying is what we need instead is for kind of shorthand a term that's catching on more and more and even with um, organisations like the Food and Agriculture Organisation is catching on uh, is agroecology. And that's the idea of working with nature, um, working in ways that acknowledge uh, you can have integrated pest management is another buzz phrase, although sometimes used with, with some of the industrial agriculture as well. But what you have is a biodiverse diversity of crops 
a whole mix of things. So you, you have agroforestry, so you might have, you know, a hundred metre wide strip of wheat, uh, maybe wheat from different races, different kinds of wheat, genetically quite different wheat all mixed in together with a strip of trees or a strip of hedge on each side of that. And that's much less prone to pests and diseases. There's much more natural pest control. It's far better for, for wildlife. Um, and you know, ideally what you're doing is you're also managing that in a way that's minimum till or no till. So you're not bashing the hell out of the soil, killing off the natural systems and then having to pour, pour in fertilizer um, and pour on pesticides to control, uh, crop, uh, to control weeds and diseases. You're working with the system so that they naturally don't get out of control. And I think one of my favourite old, old sayings that kind of helps to sum this up well, and this is where I'm going to get a little geeky about soils just for a minute, um, which is that there was a, a, apparently a very old Italian saying from the 1930s in Italy, which was when artificial fertilisers first came in. And uh, it was said that artificial fertiliser is good for the father and bad for the son. And it's really interesting because it demonstrates the knowledge and awareness that even back then, um, that if you start putting fertilizer on the soil, you might have an immediate boost in yields. But what happens is that soil gets less and less healthy and you have to keep pouring more and more fertilizer into the soil, uh, which of course is very expensive. And also you actually, you know, your yields keep falling off even if you keep pouring more and more fertilizer on. Because what you don't have and what we now understand is that in a teaspoon of healthy soil is a billion organisms. And this is where my tardigrades come in. You know, lots of microscopic animal, uh, animals, um, lots of bacteria, and particularly lots of fungi, um, which are there in a healthy soil uh, that actually work with the plants, work in a system with the plants. And one of the things that you know, I'd love to be a bit more broadly known is that most people in this call probably know that plants photosynthesize. They take the, the energy from the sun and turn it essentially into sugars. But from somewhere between, depending on the plant and the circumstances, somewhere between 30 and 50% of those sugars, the plant actually pumps out through the roots into the soil to feed the bacteria and the fungi that are there. And that bacteria and the fungi in return uh, collect nutrients, uh, break down minerals that the plant can't do itself. And so you have this whole complex system that works together in an integrated way. And of course, as soon as you start spraying poisons, start dumping huge amounts of fertilizer on that, that whole system falls apart. So what we're talking about is agroecology is working with those systems, restoring those systems, using minimum till or no till, not bashing up the, the, the soil, as I'm sure around lots around um, Cambridge at the moment, there'll be huge amounts of just beer fields. And every time I look at a beer field, my heart just sinks. Uh, because what you see is you've, just, you've done huge damage to all those systems I was just talking about, uh, damage to earthworms. Uh, but what you're also doing is losing large amounts of that soil as it gets blown away or washed away. Uh, and you know, that's soil we can't afford to lose. And globally, um, we've only got about 50 years average of harvest left in the world's soils because we're treating them so badly. So what we need to do is change the method, have much more diverse crops. And when we think about human health, this very much fits in with human health as well, because it's quite astonishing and quite scary. And I'm a, I apologize for being a little bit depressing, um, but more than 50% of human calories around the world come from four crops. Uh, now that's incredibly unhealthy for our diets and it's also incredibly food insecure. You know, if one disease comes through and cuts us straight through one of those crops, we're really in trouble. But if we think about what we could and should be doing instead, which is growing fruit and vegetables, agroforestry, a total mix of crops, uh, lots of crop diversity, then we're creating a healthy diet for ourselves. But how do we do that? That doesn't lend itself to massive tractors plowing all over the land, um, you know, working on scale. What we're talking about here is a huge amount of what you might think of as market gardening. Farms, market gardens that might be 10, 20 acres, maybe groups of them working as a cooperative. Um, lots of people. Uh, and I once had a great debate with a, um, a right winger who was saying, you terrible greens. You want to make people work on the land with their hands. And I kind of, you know, just went, um, I think you're talking about jobs, actually. Uh, but, you know, of course, not all of the jobs would have to be actually working on the land. If you had 
a ring of market gardens around Cambridge filled with mix of fruit and vegetables with lots of people working. There'd also be lots of jobs for accountants, uh, for website managers, for sales, for people who want to, you know, do promotions. Um, you think about the rich ecology of businesses that could be associated with those, those market gardens. That's the kind of things that we could have. Um, which brings me to my final point, because I do want to allow enough time for some, some Q&A. Uh, I always believe dialogue's better than monologue. But one of the huge issues in the UK, and many people don't realise, is the UK has the most concentrated land ownership in uh, Europe and one of the most concentrated land ownerships in the world. You know, when I'm actually sitting in the house, I'm sitting opposite um, quite a few people who own half of several counties just because their great, 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 great multiple times grandfather happens to be mates with William the Conqueror. Um, I'm exaggerating a little, but not very much. Um, but you, we have to talk about land reform uh, in the UK and we have to talk about how do people get access to the sort of small businesses to start up, to be able to start up small businesses growing. Wonderful organisation in Manchester called the Kindling Trust that really helps trains people both to become growers on the agronomy, but also very much on the economics and how to get the business. But one of their big issues is how do people get access to that land? So, you know, what we're talking about is an utter transformation of the countryside, a transformation of our economy. Um, I haven't talked much about supermarkets, but, you know, an underlying reason why we have the kind of um, farming economy that we have is because of the huge dominance of the supermarkets and their huge market power. The fact that they're able to force farmers, for example, dairy farmers to sell for them, milk to them at, for less than the cost of production. Um, so we're talking about transforming the retail landscape as well and not allowing supermarkets to dominate in the same kind of way. And I'll finish on this point because one of the things that Molly Scott Cato, um, our former MEP from the South West and I have a little project we've been gradually working on, uh, is that we think every small family farmer in the UK should vote green. Um, now we're some way from getting there just yet, but we're working on it. Um, uh, and that means we need to reach out to those people. We need to make sure to listen to them. We need to acknowledge there may be some cultural gaps that both sides need to bridge. Um, but we also um, need to acknowledge that they have to be crucial and they have to be protected. And that the way they're farming now is not the way many of them want to farm. It's the way the current economic system forces them to farm. And so we have to be really careful when we're talking about this to not wave our finger and say terrible farmers. We very much need to say a terrible food system uh, terrible supermarkets, terrible economic system. We want to help you to farm in the ways that you want to farm. So you know, my question is, what should the country on our side look like? I've kind of set out my image, but you know, we can have a little discussion now and then broader discussion afterwards. Thanks everyone for listening. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for that talk. It's obvious how passionate you are and understandably considering how important it is to all of us. Um, I'll jump straight into some questions because I've had quite a few very good ones. Um, if everyone doesn't mind, I'll just read them to save time. Uh, I'd like to start with one from Jeremy. Um, it's very uh, pertinent to Cambridgeshire. It says, the Cambridgeshire Fens have a large fraction of the country's peak farmland. This emits nearly as much CO2 as all human activity in the county. How should we campaign on this issue? Ah, well, that's that's an interesting one because peak has so many different layers in it. And if we talk about the the Cambridge, I don't know a huge amount about the history of the Cambridgeshire fins, but I know quite a lot about the East Anglian and Lincolnshire fins. I've actually been reading. There's a really I did a review for um, Resurgence magazine um, on a great book, little book called Imperial Mud, uh, which describes the huge uh, fight um, that existed that, that, that happened in in that area where people tried to fight off the people draining the fins. And that's something that must have happened in Cambridgeshire, I think somewhat earlier. And so it'd be really interesting to know. I, I don't know the history. Um, but the, the question was, how, how should we campaign on it? I'll start with what should happen and then think about what we, what we need to campaign about and where, how we might get to where we want to go. The practical reality of lots of peatland is that the only way we can preserve the carbon, restore the carbon in it is by re-wetting it. Um, this is land that has been you know, very heavily drained. And in fact, in Lincolnshire, I went and visited a guy, I've forgotten his actual name, but his handle on Twitter is Wheat Daddy. Um, and he and I um, started off having a debate about banning glyphosate on um, Twitter. 
and uh, to the considerable astonishment of lots of people we actually managed to have a civilized debate and he invited me to come and visit my farm and I visited his farm and it was a fascinating visit actually because um, he was one of the was one of the last bits of land drained in the 1970s when there was still um, uh, it was just before the tax relief for draining wetland was ended um, so essentially it was a tax dodge um, and if you looked at his land and you know very heavy clay real still problems still with drainage what should be done with that is it needs to be re-wet it needs to be turned back into marshland turned back into wetland with of course huge carbon and nature benefits however going to a farmer and saying your land should be abandoned um, and you should let it turn back into swamp if we ask the question about how do we campaign about that that's probably not the right place to start, I would say, in terms of the politics of it. Um, so I think, you know, what we need to do is, is this is where we can probably start with the um, with a sparing kind of approach and say we should be looking to get some of this land um, and, you know, it needs to be restored. We need to see what we can do to you know, get nature back in. You know, the area around Cambridge is essentially, a, you know, almost a wildlife desert. You know, so focus on the wildlife, focus on trying to get some small bits restored and also focus on um, minimum till and no till because that's going to cut your carbon emissions quite significantly um, and protect the soil and start to build the soil back up again. Because one of the things about peat soils is that actually as soon as you start farming them, they start degrading very, very fast. And you're talking about soils that have been degraded for a long period of time. So I think in some ways, you know, being utterly practical, you, you know, we need to think about actually, you know, significant amounts of that need to be thinking about being very wet, very different. And I think about visiting down in, um, uh, down in the southwest, um, you know, there's all sorts of interesting crops. One, there's some areas traditionally where they grew a lot of willow um, and willow can be used as a crop. Um, either potentially for, for small scale local biofuel, uh, it can also be used for all sorts of useful things that we often now use plastic for. Um, and, you know, so looking in the direction of different crops, uh, there's actually, um, when I was at the, um, the Bonn, the climate talks in Bonn a couple of years ago, um, it's a very interesting discussion about why we have the kind of crop plants that we do now. Um, there are actually lots of plants that have potential to be um, crop plants growing on very wet, even wetland type environments. But actually most of the crops we grow now came out of the Middle East originally. You think about wheat, uh, you think about barley, they came out of very dry parts and they're the crops we've adopted. So we need to think again about crop diversity, about different kinds of crops, growing things that can stand having their feet a bit wet. So I think, you know, what I talk about is saying, you know, how can we get things that fit with the environment better? How can we crop these differently? And, you know, let's think about seeing what can happen if we can save a few bits, you know, if the RSPB can take on a bit and see what happens and see what it looks like with um, it, as wetland and see how wonderful it is and what amenity value we get from that and see where that takes you. That would be my suggestions without being an absolute expert on Cambridge here, I should stress. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'll move straight on to, I had a similar question from Ellie and Mark, so I'll combine them a little. Um, Ellie said she used to work in agricultural policy and spoke to a lot of farmers. She says conventional, i.e. pesticide using farmers, tend to think that organic and agroecology farming is inefficient, irresponsible or waste of land. Um, I suppose, do most farmers, you, in your opinion, think that and how can we get them to change their mindset while working with them? I think, I think there's been a huge change, particularly focused around soils in the last four or five years. Uh, and, I'm, and I started going to the Oxford Real Farming Conference four or five years ago. Um, and back then there was the Oxford Real Farming Conference, which I think is it's coming up to its 11th year this year. Um, and when it started, it was essentially in opposition to the NFU Oxford Farming Conference. One has to dis distinguish between the Oxford Farming Conference, which is the NFU people, and the Oxford Real Farming Conference, which is us, basically. Um, uh, but actually increasingly more and more, you see farmers from the the, the NFU one sneaking down to listen in on the real farming conference. And I think, for example, of, over in, um, in Shropshire with the Shropshire Wildlife Trust, I visited a farmer and this was back when I was Green Party leader. And it was interesting because he was, he was showing his proper real credentials. He strided up to meet me in his John Deere overalls. 
looking very, very, very much not like an alternative sort of farmer. Um, uh, but he was, I was there because the wild, with the Wildlife Trust, he was looking at various undercrops underneath maize. Now, maize is a particularly dis um, damaging crop because it leaves lots of the soil bare. And so you have huge amounts of soil erosion with it. And so he was, and also he was planting legumes, various different kinds of legumes as a trial underneath to see what established well, what grew well, what was good for the soil, etc. cetera. Um, so there's really been a shift. You know, if you were in farming five years ago compared to, to farming now, there's a real shift with, it's not just people who are kind of our kind of people, pretty well every farmer who's not just utterly wedded to their ways and going to retire in two years and not really interested anyway, pretty well every farmer is really interested in how can I manage my soil better? How can I use fewer imports? What do I do about soil compaction? And gosh, running these big tractors over, it's not working very well. So there's been a real shift. But you know what that farmer said to me over in um, Shropshire was, you know, he went along and very fairly pointed out, well, you know, this one's doing really well, but the seeds are 26 pound a kilo. This one's doing really well, but the seeds are 22 pounds a kilo. This one's doing well, whatever. And, you know, the price I get from my maize, I, I just can't afford to put them in at any kind of scale. And so, you know, what we have to do is reach out to those people and point out we understand their problems are the supermarkets, the food processors, the whole system. Um, and, you know, say to them, let's find different ways, different systems, a different food system, something that lets you, pays you a fair amount for your crop. And, you know, one of the things that really distinguishes us from the Labour Party is the Labour Party is still essentially wedded to the idea of cheap food. Um, and, you know, what we need is fairly priced food and a society in which everyone has enough money to afford that fairly priced food. And, you know, if we reach out to people and show them that, they are really ready to listen now, but they, we have to be able to show them, to find for them the economics ways to make that work. Because, you know, if you're going to send yourself broke, well, that's not looking after your land. And of course, people aren't going to do it and we shouldn't be asking them to do it. So I think there has been a real shift. Sorry, I, I'm going to try a short answer one of these days. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on a similar uh, vein of how do we provide enough food at a low price? Um, Bob's asked, is vertical farming a sensible option? And does this allow more production per acre? Or is there instant sun sunshine limitation? Would it not work in our climate? I mean, what you're talking about is essentially permaculture principles. And I, I talked about, um, uh, you know, I talked about agroecology. I might have also added permaculture into that. And if you want to see um, what's not the kind of pure vertical farming, but heading in that direction, um, uh, there's a wonderful book. If you want to read more about this, it's called Miraculous Abundance. And it describes what um, a, a couple of French farmers did on a, on a very bog standard, when you look at the before photos, you know, very bog standard, very bashed around bit of um, pasture land, essentially, or cropland in Normandy. Um, and they took um, you know, vertical farming principles. Uh, they took lots of the principles that the market gardeners who used to grow a massive amount of food around Paris um, 150 years ago. Uh, and they used to do things like, you know, it's really using brain, human brain power instead of fossil fuel power. Um, uh, the, the farmers in Paris, the market gardeners in Paris used to um, get ripe uh, tomatoes in March in Paris. Um, and this was before fossil fuels, before electricity. What they did was essentially built mini greenhouses um, but, and put massive amounts of horse, comp horse manure, compost, uh, which when it decomposes under those kind of conditions produces large amounts of heat. Um, and so you had kind of natural greenhouses. Now that's not quite, we obviously don't have that much horse manure in these days. It's not quite transferable, but this group on this book, Miraculous Abundance, they took lots of the principles, lots of the knowledge. And so they've got land you know, that operates on vertical principles, uh, but also that sometimes, you know, one bit of land might have six or eight crops in it in a year. So it's intensive, but intensive in a good way, in a bio-intensive, knowledge-intensive kind of way uh, and with lots of human labor. And one of the nice things about that is it's been very much studied with lots of peer uh, um, publications in peer reviewed journals. And the figure that I often quote is they did a survey off a thousand square meters of land. Um, one person was getting an income of 22,000 euros a year, which in French rural income is a very good rural income. So you can do this and make it work. And that's what we've always got to ask everything we're talking about. Does the economics add up as well as the agronomy and the ecology add up? Because the economics has to add up. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned permaculture. 
Um, someone's just asked, has, does permaculture, is it taught in all schools in Australia? Do you know? No, absolutely no. not. Um, it's very much still an, an alternative kind of thing. You know, I mean, Australian, Australian politics, uh, without going into a long uh, you know, exposition on Australian politics, um, Australian politics is very, very divided and it's mostly, even by our standards, very right wing um, and very non-ecological. Um, you know, the Greens very much stand on their own in Australia. And that's a bit typical of, you know, Tasmania is a bit of a case study, the, the island off the south of Australia, the state. Um, you know, it's said that in Tasmania, everyone is either a logger or a greenie. Um, and that, that, that may not quite be true, but there's certainly some truth in it. <laughs> Sorry, I struggled to unmute myself. Um, I think, oh, we've hit, uh, we've hit just past eight o'clock. So I think we're going to um, leave the questions there and go into our breakout rooms now. Um, so before I say thank you, could you remind everyone what the question we'd like to do, answer in the breakout rooms is? what should be growing around the countryside in the countryside around Cambridge. Brilliant. Okay and then I'll just like to say on behalf of everyone thank you so much for coming to talk to us Natalie. Um, thank you very much I've enjoyed it great questions and discussion I appreciate it. Yeah so, yeah thank you and to everyone else uh, Natalie is needs to leave us now but we will be going off into breakout rooms which I will describe